Sure. <laughs> Please. Hello. All right. Let's, let's All right. get this started. So, um, my name is William Intrican, and no, wait, that's not right. <laughs> no, we're, we're not we'll here get there. yet. Um, <laughs> so, we. I would choose Will. Um, <laughs> choose Will. Choose Rich. The uh, we're gonna have some fun stuff I think to talk about here because you've got a fascinating history. Uh, we're gonna talk about the need for privacy and security in Web three. Uh, yeah. Who here is not a developer? Oh really? Okay. Well, I figured it was more Devi uh, in the audience, uh, so that's interesting. So well then we'll think about that then as we approach the topic. But uh, my name is Ethan Pierce. Uh, built a bunch of companies in France, in the US, France and, and Singapore on the digital marketing and e-commerce side. I uh, was in venture capital for a while and now I have two things, Borderless Ventures, which is actually based here in Tallinn, but I live in Paris, and the NFT factory, uh, which is the kind of ecosystem headquarters for French Web3. Um, turns out a lot of Web3 has happened in France and so 128 of us from Ledger and SoRare and The Sandbox and Artifact and a whole bunch of other companies created this physical hub for Web3. Um, and then other things, there's lots of cool stuff in that space, but mostly what I get to do to bring kind of a funnel of opportunity to what I do is I get to come and talk to great, oh, fascinating people, learn, and hopefully maybe transmit some of that to you so that you can get some value out of these things. So I speak at like 80 conferences a year, so I pretty much live on a plane, but it gives me the chance to have wonderful discussions and, and, and learn things. So thank you, Ashton, for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's always good to be a part of what you build and what we're doing. So I'd like to welcome Edelson uh, Sorio Jr., who, uh, well, cybersecurity expert, uh, wrote science fiction, um, you know, not, we don't say influencer anymore, so maybe KOL, because uh, you've got this big show in, in, in Portuguese, in crypto. So I'll let you maybe explain what you do, but all kinds of different things around the subject of privacy and security, because yeah. you've been in cybersecurity for the past like 25 years. Yeah. Um, so I'll let you maybe present yourself and we'll go from there. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, Ashton. Thank you, thank you again. And Christina. And Christina, and Christina. And Christina for sure. And Christina for sure. Well, I'm professor, uh, computer scientist, and I'm in cybersecurity for 25 years, as I said. And well, I do a lot of things in that field, even like I'm, I am privacy advocate every day. And then I, I have at my show, The Morning Crypto, is teaching people about the importance of uh, self-sovereign privacy and not like letting uh, your, your keys or your crypto in exchange, something like that. And uh, self-custody is pretty important to us. And I try to teach people through my classes, through my show, and educating people around the places and even in my book. Through a fiction, a, a cyberpunk fiction, I try to teach people the importance of privacy as well. The um, I loved I loved the uh, so it's uh, the Chronicles of the Code Guardians, the origin of Titan, and we'll, we'll, we'll not spend too long on the subject. But one of the things I love is there's actually a second author of his book. His name is Gerard, uh, who couldn't be with us because he's your bot that yeah. you made that helped you write the book. But you also have like a whole bunch of bots that just do lots of stuff for exactly. your, your companies and what you do. Yeah, I have Marcello and Isabella. They help me to cup and doing clips and viral clips from my, my videos every day. I have the, the Jeha, my co-author in the book. I trained him in 2022 and then he helped me to write the book. I have some some of the bots helping me with the translations, with the the voices in my show. I, have, I am surrounded by bots with a, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence as well. And because of that, I can run the business almost by myself instead of having a lot of people or a huge team. I have a very clean team with me and bots doing almost the hard work. So one of the stories that you told me, I think we can go back to the kind of get us into this thing of privacy and, and security. So we're going to talk about two main things. One is just the privacy and security conversation in general. Uh, not really a Web3 version. And then how does that become a Web3 concern? Yeah. So I think one of the first pieces of this was, so you got into Bitcoin early, you know, 2011. Yeah. Your, your first blockchain company, I think, was around 2015, I think you said. And so in Brazil, you built this company that was doing lots of things using the blockchain that eventually pissed off all of the notaries. Yeah and the digital certificate authorities who were selling services. 
there were threats on your life and you left Brazil. Then, then what the, was that? He, here I am in Estonia. That, that probably one of the biggest tricks was putting myself, my image in front of the company. If I, I was like an unknown doing an anonymous project, it was okay for my life. But at the time I was the CEO of the company and I built something in blockchain to preserve the privacy of people, but giving power to the people to authenticate, to sign things, to prove themselves uh, in institutions like notaries do, do mm. in, in Brazil, they didn't like. Then they started to stalk me in events to say, oh, you can't say this, this is not good because our friends, they don't like much. Then they became more aggressive. And in the end of 2017, after I came from New York from Consensus, they started to be more and more aggressive. In the end of the year, my lawyers, they told me, you should leave the country because it's not safe for you, for your life and for your company. They will try to block, to stop you using all the tools they have. So uh, I think the Web3 piece will bring an interesting, if we come back to that. So what are your thoughts though, looking at your background on all these couple decades in cybersecurity, what are, where are we at in terms of privacy and security individually today, but not necessarily Web3, but just in general? Um, what you know, our phones, all the things we do that we're giving our data to, you know, social media, all of the, you know, everything we're looking at with AI and, you know, what are your just general thoughts about yeah. what it means to be private today? Can we have privacy? Yeah. Uh, can we use all these things that we want to use? Can we watch our Netflix? Can we order from Amazon? Can we have our life and yet expect a sense of privacy from that? Yeah. No company will provide privacy for us. We need to build or try to get our privacy back uh, with all tools they are available. Um, on Web3 or outside Web3, we are giving up our data all the time, even for AI. All the time we are going to check GPT and asking to do something. We are just giving data and giving more data. If you are connecting our GitHubs on Copilot to help devs on doing their things, it's reading the environment of our, our applications and getting even the API keys and passwords we are trying to make it secret, they are having access because we are just giving them all the information. So the information is going to GitHub, to Microsoft, and ending with OpenAI to train the, 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 the machine learning and the, the models. So it's very important to us to understand what is happening, what kind of data we are willing to give and how can we protect ourselves from giving too much information to them? Because we don't need to provide that much of information, even for our transactions, for our transactions. If you are in the blockchain space, we can use a lot of tools to provide uh, privacy on our transactions. Because, well, we have curtains on our windows, not these windows, but in our windows, because of something. We were closed because of something. Everyone has something very personal they, they don't want to show. It's not because of, I have nothing to hide. Look, everyone has something to live in the personal aspect of their lives. They don't need to give up all the information all the time. And the companies, they are making a lot of money on top of our information, selling our information. We have no control about where are our information right now. They are being processed with other information. And on Web3, maybe we can get, we can be in charge of what information we are giving up, to whom, mm -hmm. and for who, what, what they will do with that information. So I think for those of you that are, that are devs and building things, but also if you're here more on the entrepreneur side or wanting to, 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 to build tech or startups and um, without necessarily being the dev, one of the topics that we have a lot, there's two big topics that we have in Europe because of GDPR compliance. Uh, one of them is, just, is privacy by design. So as a developer, you can build your solution to respect privacy from the get-go. So we're not talking about building something and thinking about how do I now respect people's privacy with the thing I've built. You actually build it intentionally to respect that. So uh, you've got things like um, uh, embedded AI in hardware products so it doesn't actually have to send information out yeah. to the cloud. So there's, there's, there is no, like if you speak to your coffee pot to say, hey, make me some coffee, it doesn't actually have to send all of your conversations to Amazon to finally figure out when you ask for coffee. If they put an embedded AI chip into it and it just understands a few things, one of which is make me some coffee. Like there's all kinds of ways that we can build tech that respects privacy by design. 
Um, and that's really important as devs or even just as, as the, the entrepreneurs behind projects to realize that you can do that. Um, and that that's going to become a value add in significant ways for people because people are going to look more and more for solutions that are have privacy by design yeah. baked in. And then uh, just this idea of in Europe, we have something very much around um, data sovereignty. And what that means is uh, you want... For individuals, for sure, but if we're talking about sovereign things like countries, for large corporates, they want all of their data to stay in Europe. And so they're not using necessarily AWS or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure or, or, or Huawei or, or whoever to, for their cloud computing and for their AI infrastructure if they need that to stay in Europe. They're using companies like OVH or Scaleway or DigitalOcean or other companies that if they only have data centers in Europe, they can't accidentally spin up, uh, you know, uh, another um, Kubernetes cluster that happens to be in Virginia because you clicked the wrong button. And all of a sudden you just spent $2 million in GDPR fines because you fucked up um, and your intern made a mistake. So like, that's really important to be thinking about data sovereignty as well in that context. But moving from the regular tech space just into Web3, you already kind of touched on it. What is this idea of, what can Web3 do more for us? Or maybe also more important, what are the risks yeah. in front of us for everything that's Web3. And by Web3, we can throw in crypto and blockchain and whatever we want to talk about. Um, one of the obvious ones we talked about is CBDCs. Yeah. But what are the, how can Web3 help to protect us by abstracting some of that information? But then also, what are the risks? Yeah, I think we have two verticals to work with. Uh, identity It's a pretty important place to improve the privacy. And the second one is privacy on our transactions. They are two different things and two totally different uh, spaces to work. On, on the identity side, we can decide what data from our attributes we are delivering to whom for and for what. Mm. It's very important and we can use zero knowledge proofs. Uh, that's old cryptography technology and protocols, but they are being implemented right now in identity and it's very important. So instead of giving away my birth date, the the entity will just ask my identity. Is he uh, over 18 years old? And the cryptographer of my identity will just answer back, yes. Or has he more than 30,000 euros in the bank account? Instead of doing, giving up my statements and all the informations, I, it, uh, the entity just ask my identity and it will answer back, yes, he has. So on identity side, we can have attributes, working with attributes, and those attributes with zero knowledge proofs, then we have more control about the attributes we are delivering. Mm. And they will be trackable. So if the company sells our data, we can track the selling or where our data is getting into, where the, the, the final place where it is. And the second part is for transactions. If you want to have privacy on the transactions we are doing, we have many tools and privacy is a right. It's not too wrong like using privacy tools to, to have more privacy on your, on your uh, transactions. For example, if I want to do a donation for Ukraine, just an, an example, I really don't want the Russians in that case tracking my, my donation to my, myself here in Estonia. So it's not too wrong. If I'm if I doing some job for someone in another country, he doesn't need to know everything I have in my wallet. So using tools for, for improving the privacy on your transactions, they are good. Sometimes they are used by bad person, by, by, by bad people, but I think the criminals should be tracked by, uh, through an investigation by the government. They can't, it's not correct, like uh, forbid our rights of, for privacy like they are trying to do. Like here in, in, in Europe, they are trying even a, a new law to put back doors in every software that has encryption of any time of encryption to have a way to access the data being transacted over there. And I, I hope it did not, not pass, but they are talking about it here in Europe, in United States, in Brazil, all the countries with the CBDCs, they are trying to have more control and more access to the data we are we have. And it's up to us protect our privacy as it's our right. 
so I know not everybody who's who's participating in this weekend is coming into it as a Web3 degen or blockchain or crypto person. A lot of you are coming here to also learn about that. Have you heard of a CBDC? Who raise your hands if you know what that means? Okay, yeah, that's okay. actually interesting. Good. So central bank digital currencies uh, are basically just when we talk about Bitcoin or, or other uh, cryptos that exist as currencies for for means of transfer of value. Uh, the idea is, well, why not have dollars and euros that are just digital, like bitcoins, um, and if so, those would be sovereign. So that that would be the US or that would be Europe that would create these digital currencies. So central bank um, digital currencies. What's the problem? Well, I am... Problems. <laughs> yeah, problems, problems, and a lot of problems. One of the biggest concerns is about the control, because they, they have access to control every every place where you're trying to spend your own money. Like they can even create some laws of this money you are getting, you should spend just in this place and not another. Then it could, it, it will concern us about control. They will know everything you, you are doing. And with the ESG uh, crazy, because sometimes they go crazy. ESG is important, but sometimes they go crazy. They could say, oh, you spend all your carbon credits. So, uh, you can't buy, or can't put gas on your car, or you can't buy uh, a beef to do a barbecue. I, I don't know, because you spend all of your credits. They will have that kind of control with CBDCs. Mm -hmm. The privacy of knowing everywhere you are spending your money, they, they don't need to know at every time I go to the pharmacy or every time I get a bus. And they control, imagine a totalitarian country, like China does this kind of thing, a social score. And sometimes they decide where people can go or if they can get the train because of their social score. So if you are not good for the country, for somehow, they can get the money from your pockets, they can block your money on your pockets because it will be digital, they can forbid you for doing your transactions mm. or tracing all of the places you, you are. And we have the hack problem because governments are hacked all the time and they will leak those kind of informations to the market and it will happen. It's just kind of a when, not if it will happen. So we have a lot of concerns on that. The, and, you know, Associate General, for example, did, uh, they created a digital currency and we're playing with it the last year. And one of the interesting things was in the smart contract. So this, is a, this isn't a central bank digital currency, it's, it's a private institution, but looking at how would they handle doing digital currencies internally at a bank. Except if you looked at the smart contract, they had the, the, the authority as the, the, the authority behind this, this digital currency, because they're the ones validating everything of the transactions they could at any point in time just pull money back out of wallets. So it's a digital currency, but it's far from being crypto in the identity of what we think of crypto uh, could be. And, and I'm not somebody who, who is, is libertarian, anti-establishment, like we shouldn't do all that stuff, but there is a difference between being completely kind of anarchist about no governments, no touching my, my shit, and what could happen if they have access to all of the data and control over absolutely everything that you have. When it comes to money laundering, I mean, there's a reason there's a sign at the airport that says you can't go past this point if you have more than $10,000 of stuff, whether it's a nice watch or cash or, or whatever, because we already have perfect systems for money laundering. It's bags of cash, it's bearer bonds, it's, it's, it's the Rolex on your arm um, because you, you fly to between two countries five times a month and every month you happen to have a new Rolex on your arm because you're using it to transfer capital from one side to the other. Like, there's amazing ways to already launder money and move capital around the world. We don't need digital currency for that. However, um, we need to be careful that, that we're not losing the freedom to have some privacy yeah. to our transactions because of putting things into digital, yeah. because that does make more of a, a situation. Perhaps. The banks already see everything, the Visa already sees everything, your phone is pinging several towers yeah. right now, um, so the metadata that's out there, they already see everything, but I think we need to be careful how much we let digital currencies drift yeah. into this thing. Yes? Yeah, I have two more con concerns about inclusivity, because they are delivering the, the CBDCs through banks, and the people who are unbanked, they are unbanked because banks don't want them in the system. So if they deliver the CBDCs through banks, they, they will be still 
in the same situation as unbanked people. And in Brazil, they are discussing to put a control in the Brazilian CBDC to prevent a bank run. So if they are conceiving that kind of crazy idea, it's because they know they will fuck up the economy at some point. So we have a lot, we should discuss more the CBDCs with the government and understand what is behind the thing. Mm -hmm. Control and privacy, we, will, we can lose everything that, that, in that field. And to that point, last point, and then we're done. Um, who here is from Estonia? Who lives here? Everyone? So the next conversation might not be, you know, not conversation, but just last point, because he's wearing this shirt, and so I, I would be hesitant not to be, be, you know, I should bring it up, because if you're not from here, e-residency is a fantastic thing, because if you do a digital business, if you have an online company, if you're based anywhere in the world but you need to have a, a way to do business in Europe, e-residency, which has nothing to do with residency, it's not, it's not uh, immigration. But uh, in Estonia, you know, I, I have it, my Borderless Ventures is, is based here because of being able to go through that process. I can have a, I have a company in France as well, but, but here I can have a fully digital company because of a fully digital administration doing a fully digital activity uh, that's an interesting thing if you're not from here. Um, and it's not expensive, it's a super interesting thing. For example, when I started the company, uh, the last company here in January, um, if without e-residency it would have taken up to a month and would have cost like seven or eight hundred euros to start the company. Because I had e-residency, at 9.15 in the morning I plugged my little blue card into my computer, I submitted the application, I paid like 180 bucks or something like that. Three hours later I had a company. Uh, and it was done. Like, I mean, it's, in, it's amazing the efficiency of that system and then all of the administration of that online as well is, is super interesting. So if you're not from here and you're looking at doing a, as a dev something that's very much fully digital or mostly digital, yeah. it's very interesting if you have anything you want to add to e-residency, but then we're done. Yeah, uh, I was invited by the government to be an e-residency e envoy, so I'm kind of ambassador of uh, e-residency so I can talk for them. So. For everyone who wants to bring or open a company over here and like eliminate all the bureaucracy opening a company and running everything digital without living in Estonia because you don't need to live in Estonia. It's pretty cheap and fast to open and you can manage everything from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, so uh, I'm, I, I, like, I am biased to talk about the residency because I opened my company as uh, uh, e-residency first then, talking to Startup Estonia, I incorporated the company, uh, I got the, the Startup Visa, now I'm living in Estonia uh, through Startup Visa as well. Fantastic. So, uh, if you have any questions for Edelson, uh, he'll be um, uh, available the rest of the day, probably, I think, if, if, or at least a bit there, so if you have sure. questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'm going to wrap this one up, and then we're going to, I'm actually moderating the next panel as well, so we'll just move <laughs> on to that, but um, please give Edelson a huge round of applause. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.